With the Detroit Pistons season coming close to an end and numerous players being ruled out for the year, a lot of players missing quite a few of the last few games, I want to get into grading the Pistons' in-season moves and how effective they actually were. We'll talk about that in today's episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast. You are Locked On Pistons, your daily Detroit Pistons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's the deal? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast. Per usual, I'm your host, Kuka Hill. You can find me over on Twitter at Kuka Hill. I want to thank you guys for being Locked On Pistons, your first listen of every single day. We're free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Locked On Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. That's another great way to support the podcast. We're on our road to 8,000 subscribers. We are right there. I think we're like 40, 50 subscribers away. So please, if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe on the YouTube channel, support the community. I really would appreciate it. Um, in today's episode, we'll be talking about rest versus ending the season strong, something Monty Williams commented about earlier on today. Then at the end of the podcast, I have a few just random thoughts that I've been thinking about over the last, over the weekend. I don't think any of them really go anywhere. And I don't really know if like how much, you know, people really want to give weight to any of these random thoughts, but it's just some things that I've just been like quickly thinking of. And I thought I'd just throw out there and see if anyone else is thinking the same stuff. But to start off, I, I want to grade the Pistons in season moves that they made this season. And the reason why I want to do that now is quite a few. Um, well, let's just go ahead and say it. So Simone Fontecchio is ruled out again. I'm um, in the Pistons next game against the Memphis Grizzlies. He's missed the last handful of games. And I'm not sure if we're going to see him again for this year. Um, another one of the Pistons in season moves was Quinn Grimes, who also just got uh, ruled out for the season. Um, and the Pistons got a few other, you know, end of bench guys in their moves, but a lot was made when the Pistons made those moves. They changed basically the entire roster in a matter of like two, three weeks. Um, so I, I, with the main pieces, I'd say being Simone Fontecchio and Grimes, both Grimes for sure, but looking like Fontecchio as well, being out for the rest of the year, let's go ahead and just grade the in-season stuff, the in-season in moves that they made, how effective they actually were. Was it worth it? Just, well, let's just give our thoughts on it. I, I don't know if it's going to get better or worse by the end of this year with the main ones basically probably not playing. Um, so let's start off. I want I want to start off with the the Isaiah Livers Marvin Bagley trade for uh, Danilo Gallinari and Mike Muscala. Looking back on it, was that deal was that a good deal? Was that an effective move? Um, it more so just evens out to a eh, okay move. Because I think Marvin Bagley was a better backup five for the Pistons this year if they were trying to win than James Wiseman. But it was quite obvious, and it's been proven to be quite obvious, that the Pistons prioritized getting James Wiseman quite a bit of minutes over, I'd say, winning right now to get an idea of is he going, is he going to improve? Can they bring him back next year? So they got off of Marvin Bagley's contract, um, which – was 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 not a good contract, but not necessarily sure I'd give up a pick to get two players that you then got rid of immediately. Like they they played Danilo Gallinari for just a few games and he was waived. They played Mike Muscala for a handful of games, then he was waived. And when they those two guys were on the floor, the Pistons actually looked really good, which I think will lend itself to the discussions we have during the offseason of should the Pistons go out and get a stretch big at the five? Because when they played the five position next to Asar Thompson, the Pistons destroyed in their minutes. I believe both lineups, both duos of Asar and Danilo and Asar and Mike Muscala, both of them net rating plus 18 or more. They were destroying teams on the floor and it gave enough space to now run pick and roll over and over with Asar, gave Asar more driving lanes to utilize his finishing ability and kick out ability. So I think that it, if, for those like two weeks, handful of games, its purpose that it served was to give the Pistons an idea of, hey, maybe we should go get uh, a stretch big at the five position this offseason. Maybe that is the best route to go if we are going to make Asar Thompson such a priority. I think that's the best it did as far as, 
in-season stuff, the Pistons did win probably their most games in a single span. They won like four games and they're in the next like 10, 12 games. And remember, we had that whole conversation of, are the Pistons actually better without Cade? Because Cade wasn't playing during that stretch, even though it was ludicrous. It had to do with them, the Muscala and Gallinari joining the team and, and contributing veteran leadership and also the ability to space the floor out. The Pistons all of a sudden started making threes when they showed up, and that translated a lot uh, to their win. So I, I'd say this trade was eh, but not didn't do too much. Um, probably would have done more, I'd say, if Gallinari and Muscala remained on the Pistons. Because they actually were helping the team a lot. And I, I really would have liked to see them play the rest of the year with Cade, with Asar, and just seeing, you know, what it looked like. Because it was looking good. But I, I'd rate it as an ad trade. Um, then the Pistons, obviously, they released a lot of players. But they made a trade. I think the, the biggest trade, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, was for Simone Fontecchio. They traded Kevin Knox and a few second-round picks um, for Simone Fontecchio. Uh of the oh, he was currently of the Utah Jazz, um, or he was at the time of the Utah Jazz. Uh, Simone Fontecchio, that trade, absolute home run. That trade has been absolutely fantastic for the Detroit Pistons. Simone has been exactly what the Detroit Pistons needed, which was a guy who had a little bit more length to him, was a, a lot better defensively, um, provided spacing, provided movement shooting provided the ability to score without the ball in his hands off ball provided the ability to attack closeouts uh really well um Simone was just I think he was a godsend in every way possible for the Detroit Pistons he only played 16 games for them but in those 16 games 48 percent from the field 43 percent from deep on six and a half attempts um per game shooting 85 percent from the free throw line averaged 15 points a game um and four and a half rebounds Simone Fontecchio, absolute home run of a trade. He's going to just upgrade clearly from his position. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that was a home run of a trade. Easily one of the best trades the Pistons have made over the last. was not very good for the Detroit Pistons like really at all in in the six games he played for them. Um he shot 21% from the field, 14% from deep. That's horrific. Um now look, he provides some defensive stuff, you know, he looked cool on defense and he you can see how his archetype would fit and he that fourth quarter against the
basketball team. Um, and I, I, I think that was something we watched with the Pistons. When they were not hitting threes, it was hard because they just were awful defensively and they soaked up the ball a lot. Um, when they hit threes, obviously it was, you know, when Boyan would go off for 30 randomly and Burks would have 30 off the bench in 19 minutes. Like, yeah, obviously that would help. But I honestly think the, the most positive thing you can say about that trade isn't about Quinn Grimes. It's simply about moving off of Boyan and Burks and giving all those minutes to Simone Fontecchio, basically. That was the best part of that trade. Because Simone was so good for the Pistons after they got rid of those guys in the minutes he soaked up for them that he basically removes, like, any thought of Boyan and Burks' fan base. Like, no one's mentioned them at all, at all in the Pistons fan base because of how good Fontecchio is. And hopefully, you know, Grimes comes back next year, if he's on the team still, comes back next year and is able to show, you know, why they traded for him and and is able to hit more than 14% of his threes. So um, let me know what you guys think, though. Comment section down below or over on Twitter, at Kuka Hill. How do you guys grade the Pistons in-season moves? I guess my final grade of these moves would be like C+. I, like, because the Pistons had to do something. They had to make moves. They couldn't just sit around. But then a lot of the moves they made were like mo- like releasing Muscala and Gallinari. Like Flynn has been, I, I, okay, Evan Fournier. I, and then Grimes didn't even play. So like the real move that really affected anything was Simone Fontecchio. Everything else was more so just shuffling pieces on the board. So. Give it like a CC plus. So again, let me know in the comment section down below or over on Twitter at Kuka Hill. How do you guys feel about the Pistons in season moves? When we come back, rest versus ending the season strong. I'll give my thoughts on that situation when we come back. Price Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less than on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. March is over, but the biggest moments in college basketball tip off the month of April. Be a part of the action on Price Picks for both men's and women's college basketball. Get in on the playoff action and win up to 10, 100 times, I'm sorry, your money on Price Picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Price Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into 1000 with basketball, hockey, college basketball entries today on Price Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Download the app today and use code Locked in NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Again, download the app today and use code Locked in NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Price Picks. Again, download the app today and use code Locked in NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars with Price Picks. So I want to thank you guys again for being Locked On Pistons, your first listen of every single day. We're free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Locked On Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on. That's another great way to support the podcast. So over the last few games, I think the fan base has witnessed it themselves without Monty Williams coming out and saying what he said today. Um, by the way, happy Easter, everybody. Hope you guys had a great one. Um, Kay Cunningham has missed a few games over the last two weeks. Jane Ivey missed the previous game. Um, Jalen Duran has missed a few games. Simone Fontecchio obviously has missed all these games. Queen Grimes has missed all these games. Isaiah Stewart has rolled out for the season. Uh, I'm not going to include Asar Thompson in any of this because of how serious his, like, bigger than basketball health concern is. So uh, we're just going to continue to send prayers his way, and hopefully, you know, they, he he gets better. Um, and they figure everything out with him, but we're completely removing a SAR. Again, let me say very clear. We are completely removing anything in regards to a SAR and his, his health concern from this conversation, completely removing it. Um, I think now removing him from it, I, there's been talk already about the Pistons basically shutting the season down a few, like a week ago because they weren't going to play Jalen Duran. They weren't going to play a K Cunningham. They weren't going to play Simone. They weren't going to play um, even after Ivy missed the game. Um, Isaiah Stewart got shut down for the year, second straight year. Like, is he being shut down for the season because he actually could not play the rest of the year? Or is it because he's hurt? The season's lost. It's over with. Might as well not try to come back this year. Just go ahead and miss the rest of the year. Like, that's been a talk in the Pistons fan base, in the Pistons community over the last, I'd say, like two weeks now. Now, Cade did end up coming back and actually playing a few games. Um, Jalen Dern, the same thing, did come back and end up playing a few games. Um, but today, on Easter, 
Um, Monty Williams was asked about if he plans to have players build momentum down the stretch or prioritize making sure guys are healthy. By the way, I'm getting this all from James Edwards III's tweet um, today. He said he prefers guys to play and go into summer sore, not hurt. If that means less minutes, he wants guys to play. So that brought the attention to, or made me want to talk about the whole argument of rest versus ending the season strong. And I think where, where, I, end, where I find myself on this discussion I think it's almost always going to be – actually, you know what? let me take that back because there's some situations where I'm not going to be on that. But I'd say mostly I'm, I would be on the side of ending the season strong, finish the year out, and trying to go into the offseason on a good note. Like unless you are the Detroit Pistons rebuild one, one year in, two years in, heck, even three years in, and you're trying at the end of the year when B is in the upcoming draft, you want to secure those top odds. Like, okay, you want to tank the end of the year? So be it. Like, a win in April, two wins in April is not going to do anything for you to change it. Wemby could change everything. Like, that that kind of stuff. And if you're a re- if you're just straight up tanking and rebuilding team anyways, like like I said, if you're in the first or second year, and that's how you want to end the season, you want to just rest everybody, make sure no one gets hurt, take the L's, get the top odds. Like, okay, I, unfortunately, that's just something that happens in the NBA. That's what's going to happen when you have a lottery system. And, heck, you see it happen in other sports like the NFL – Actually, you didn't see it as much, especially. Well, you still see it in the NFL, but Houston definitely changed the changed it a little bit when they went out and won their final game and got C.J. Shroud instead of tanking for it. I, I don't think they knew at the time that they would be blessed like they did, but you get what I'm saying either way. But the Pistons are not in that situation anymore. So if you're in that situation, fair. Rest everybody, lose. You know, it is what it is. The Pistons are not in that situation anymore. They are in year four, coming off of what we just talked about in the first segment, changing eight pieces on the team, really making a million moves and having to make decisions on guys as soon as the season ends. Like in a week and a half, two weeks, we are going to get immediate decisions, I think, on the organization, the front office, and the head coaching staff. And I think even as soon as the season ends, you'll start to hear rumors and you'll start to hear whispers and you'll start to hear some leaks come out, whether it's on this podcast or another or through the beat writers about some decisions that the team is going to start making or is already leaning towards making on this roster once the season ends. With that being the case, I think you absolutely should end the season strong. You want to play everybody that is available to play and let them get as many minutes as they can in. And I especially mean this for a guy like Kay Cunningham, who I know a goal of his is to reach that 65 games threshold. He wants to play 65 games at least this year. Now, obviously, he would have wanted to play – his every player's goal, most players' goal, I'd say. Obviously, God, God willing, it, just don't get hurt and play all 82. Like, obviously, that's a goal, but a realistic goal, knowing that injuries are going to happen, you will get nicked up, like stuff like that's going to happen. 65 games is a goal, and he's four games away from that. So, I want K to get to that goal. I want him to be able to get there. That would be the most games he's played in his in his uh, in a season in his career. Obviously, missed last year, rookie season, he only played 64 games. And in, in any other like any other year in the future, if the Pistons are good or whatever, in case having a good season, 65 games where you have to get to to be eligible for the awards. So that's a place you really want to set the goal for now and moving forward. Um, so I do think that's pretty important. And also, Kate has had a good year. Let's end the season strong. Let him end the season strong. Go into the offseason feeling good about his season, whether the team won or not. Let him go into the offseason feeling good about how well he played. Because right now he's coming off games of 33 points, 32 points. And after the All-Star break, I'd say he mostly played pretty insane. Uh, Outside of this six-game stretch after he started showing up on the injury report um, where he was struggling, there was a good like 11, 12 games after the All-Star break. He was the best three-point shooter in the league. And he was playing absurd level basketball. So, point is, I would let Cade, especially someone in his position coming off the injury he came off of with that goal of 65 games, how well he's played, let him play strong to end the year. Also with Jay and Ivy and Jalen Duran, I mean, you need to get every look possible at those guys. Because Jay and Ivy, like, let's just be, let's just be honest, and we'll talk about this in his uh, season review. Jay and Ivy has been pretty bad now for like a month, month and a half. Like, it's been, he's been pretty bad now for a while. I mean, he had that one game where he exploded for 34 games and Kate had 30. But he has been pretty bad for a minute now, since February 13th. 
And you need to get every look as you can at him because I think this offseason, they're going to make some decisions on some key guys. I think that's coming. So you want to get as many looks as possible at these guys. Like over the last 21 games, Ivy is shooting 36% from the field and 23% from deep. It just isn't isn't good enough. It, like, it's just not. So you need to get every look at Jay Ivey as possible. Sitting him for the rest of the year, what's that going to do? What, what are you resting him for? I'm not saying he is going to be traded. I'm not saying that. But he, it's, it's possible he gets traded. So what, what like, are you resting him to not get hurt or something? Like, I, and so you can then trade? Like, I don't see any purpose for sitting him. You want to get every look as possible at Jane Ivey and seeing if those two guys can fit. And then the same thing with Jalen Duran. Jalen Duran, I think you need, again, if he all of a sudden these last nine games, eight games, averages like four blocks a game, is it changing your perspective on the entire season, him defensively? No. But if he plays really well defensively down the stretch, could you say, okay, there's the flashes that we've been looking for. He Maybe the health concerns was real. Maybe he finally feels healthy. Can you say, okay, he's finally coming along, came in way, real late into the season, but we're actually seeing those flashes. We're seeing that ability. Can we believe that's something we can harness moving forward? Like, you need to get as many looks at this at this this, this team, this, this core, as possible. Especially Cade, but the other guys as well. So... And then everyone else, I, I you know, I don't think there's too many guys that, that matter too much outside of that. But your three main guys, you need to get as many looks as them as possible and let them try to finish the season strong, especially Cade. And then for the other two guys, you're basically the Pistons are in in does this guy fit with the team or do we need to trade him mode? Like that's basically where they're at. They've been at that, I think, since February. Are we gonna be trading this guy this offseason or are we keeping him? Like that's the decision. And they need as many games as possible to make that decision. So I don't get the – and they're really young. I forgot. That's the main point. Like, these guys are super, super young. It's not like these guys are 30, 31, 32. These guys are in their second, third season in the NBA. They don't need to be rested for the offseason. They'll be straight, okay? If they go into the offseason a little sore, they'll be all right, okay? Give them two weeks, they'll be straight. Like, come on. But that, that's my thoughts on the rest first uh, in the season strong argument. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below or over on Twitter at Cook. Yo, when we come back, I just have some random thoughts. Um, about this team. Did Steph Curry just hit a dagger three against the Spurs? I got the Spurs game on the screen right next to me. Uh, no, Clay Thompson just did. Oh, my God. Um, but I have some random thoughts for you guys when we come back. Um, stay tuned for that. Fire TV is your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening week for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels that to deliver a constant supply of of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports, March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you absolutely should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on fire TV today. So I want to thank you guys again for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. Free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Locked On Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five star review on our podcast platform you're listening to this on. There's another great way to support the podcast. Um, so I have a I just have a quick um I I just have some like quick thoughts, like random thoughts that have been going through my head. And I don't really like plan on taking it anywhere, like this this thought anywhere. This is this something that popped into my head and it keeps like popping into my head as I go, you know, throughout Pistons Twitter or I read some Piston articles or I look through some clips this past weekend. Um and I, it's a genuine like I, I guess it's a question, but something I noticed in I, I guess the, let me go ahead and just get out the way. I, I, let's not beat around the bush. So, why when it, why, why do so many fans and why do so many people like when it comes to fit? 
why are so many people drawn to forcing players to fit together? I, I like I I I I just really like had a quick thought go through my head this past week. I'm like, huh, like why? Like why is it such a big deal? And I, the only the only like reason I can come up with is just getting attached to players emotionally. Like for example, it's clear that the Detroit Pistons franchise player is Kay Cunningham. Once they got that first overall pick and Kay arrived and he played how he did at the end of his rookie season over the last few months of the season. And he played how he played this year individually. Like he's going to get a max extension, I would say, this offseason. I, I'd say that pretty confidently. He's going to get that. This is the guy you're building around. Once you get that player, once you get him, the one you want to build around, your best player, like the guy that you're going to surround, you're going to surround your team with. Why does it matter if like another guy on the team that's currently on the team doesn't fit? Why does it matter if another guy that's currently on the team isn't the cleanest fit? Like why? Why why is it stress people out? Why? Why do people get so like hell bent on forcing that fit to happen instead of just then going and inquiring a player you know is going to fit? Like what? What is the? Why do people do that? Yeah, I think the easy answer, the easy response that I get is, um, well, these are young guys and they have upside. So if you can force them to fit, they may turn into you know superstars. You don't you don't want to move off of them and they could be superstars, whatever. Like okay, I can get that. I get that to a certain extent. But I, another, what I would come back with, every fan base thinks every young player they have is going to become a superstar. Everybody thinks their young player is going to be Dwayne Wade. Every single one of their young play, every single fan base thinks one of their players is going to be LeBron, uh, is going to be Dwight Howard, is going to be, you know, a top 10 player in the NBA. Everyone thinks that every fan base thinks every single one of their young core members is going to be a superstar. The sad reality is 99.9% .9 of those players are not going to be that. So once you get a K Cunningham, once you get a top overall pick, once you get your franchise player, why is everything not just about, okay, then we're just going to go get players that fit around them and enable them to be the best selves they can possibly be, can help them reach their peak as soon as possible, and can help them reach their peak more easily rather than force the fit of guys because we have an emotional connection to them. Because really, that's the only argument I can see. That's the only argument I can see for why – so many people want to force certain players to fit, even though maybe it's not the cleanest fit, even though maybe it doesn't make the, even though if, I'll, I'll leave it at that, even if they're not the cleanest fit and it doesn't work the best, instead of just going and getting players that you know would fit and you know would make your best player the best possible and you know will help him speed his development the best and quickest way possible and help him reach his peak, the only reason for not doing that is emotional connection, I'd say. Like, that's where I've went with it right now. That, And I haven't put, like I said, it's just some random thoughts I've had over the weekend. We'll probably dive into that a little bit deeper in the offseason. Um, but I haven't dove any deeper than that into that into that topic. And that's all I got on it. It's just what's been going through my head recently. So if you guys got any, like, uh, answers or, or feelings on those thoughts, I'd love to hear from it. Have a back and forth about it. Because again, this is I haven't dove any deeper into it outside of my just instant thoughts on it and just want to get it out on here. So let me know in the comment section down below or over on Twitter at Kuka Hill how you guys feel about that and what do you guys think about that topic and which side do you find your guy you yourself on? Um, again, let me know in the comment section down below or over on Twitter at Kuka Hill. That's all I've got for you guys today. Thank you guys for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. We're free to web on our podcast platforms. Hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel. Leave us a five-star review, whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. And until next time, I'll see you guys later. Stay safe out there. And until next time, peace out.